Wouldn't it be cool if there was a Netflix for finance? Well, there is. It's called Real Vision, and it gives you unprecedented access to some of the most respected names in finance. Watch interviews with legends like Kyle Bass, Jeff Gunlock, Stanley Drunkenmiller, and many, many more. If you want to be part of the Real Vision revolution, visit realvision.com slash WSO. Hello, you're listening to the Wall Street Oasis podcast, a podcast about breaking into the world of finance, along with interviews with those who have. I'm your host, Alex Grodnick, and today we are speaking with Mike Hopkins, the CEO of Hulu. I think everyone probably knows what Hulu is, but after listening to this, you definitely will. Mike, hi. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I have so many questions. I kind of want to take it in a few different segments, um, starting off with career, how you got here, um, and then maybe talk a little bit about your business, and then at the end, we'll finish up with some advice. That sounds great. Okay. So let's start off right after college. What happened? <laughs> uh, well, I, right out, I got out of college in 1990, uh, a long time ago, uh, and my first job was selling uh, advertising for the Hart Hanks Penny Saver down in Orange County, California. And my job was essentially uh, selling shopper direct mail advertising to uh, businesses and strip malls and car washes and things like that. So I was going door to door selling advertising. And, and I did that for about four and a half years right out of college and uh, gained a lot of great experience and um, had my first management opportunity there. And, and, uh, Really learned how to take no for to not take no for an answer and to move past it and to really uh, uh, work through that that challenge of of basically having the door slammed in your face every day multiple times a day. Yeah, you hear a lot of people at your level CEOs kind of talking about the Mark Cuban garbage bags door to door. There's something about getting told no over and over and over that maybe builds something inside of you. Well, yeah, you have to you have to compartmentalize that and know that they're really not saying no to you. They're saying no to whatever you're offering. And 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 for me, I thought it was fun to just take it as a challenge as to how do you get past that? How do you how do you sort of deal with it, get past it, use it to your advantage in some way to 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 build something? Right. And then then what happened? Well, then I I actually my next job after that I I took a job selling medical supplies uh, for the Kendall company, uh, Curad bandages and things like that uh, at the hospitals. And um, I did that for a little less than a year, actually. It was a very short stop. Um, didn't enjoy that, that, that job at that time very, very much. And uh, not long after I took that job, I, I got an opportunity to go into TV for the first time. And so I moved into the Weather Channel here in LA and was selling the Weather Channel to cable operators up and down the West Coast. And uh, I did that for about a year and, and got a gr- what really ended up being a, the transformative opportunity for me was a, 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 a similar job at Fox. Um, at that time, Fox was a, a nascent cable business, cable network business. It was a joint, actually a joint venture with Liberty Media at that time, Fox Liberty Networks. And uh, from there, I just was so fortunate to get opportunity after opportunity to to grow my career and take on new challenges, and I was there about 18 years. Wow. And so tell us what you did at Fox. You were doing affiliate sales, right? Yeah, I was in affiliate sales and marketing was the, was the department, and we essentially uh, were selling at the beginning FX and FX Movie Channel, which is now called FXM, to cable and satellite operators and, and essentially wanted to get them to carry the channels and, and pay us a little bit of money for, for that. Um, and we were trying to get those businesses to scale, and and um, and it just every single year, uh, literally, we would de- you know, we would buy a new network, we'd launch a new network, and it just became this uh, massive business over over that 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 time. And um, and for me, it was great because I got in early. There wasn't a lot of people in the department, and it just was there was just opportunities everywhere you look to be promoted to get more to do to get opportunity and and it was great right so you had this long career there up through all the levels so you're at the top and what were you thinking yeah well so you know I'd say the last six or seven years there I was running the department I was the head of distribution for the company and as part of that uh, I also got the opportunity to sit on boards Uh, we had a lot of joint ventures and they still have a lot of joint venture businesses Um, National Geographic Channel the Big Ten Network 
uh, and Hulu was one of the JVs that, that we were part of. And, and I got the opportunity to be a little bit involved at the beginning of Hulu uh, in my role there at Fox. And then after uh, three or four years, I did join the board. And, and so for two and a half, three years, I was on the board of Hulu before I ended up getting the opportunity to run the company. And, and uh, I think it was, uh, it was you know, sort of uh, a magical thing that I was able to get this job because uh, I knew everybody on the board. Uh, I was able to earn their trust and, um, and the opportunity pre- presented itself. And, and I, I, had to, I had to see if I could do it. Yeah, I mean, who says no to being the CEO of this amazing media tech company? So like, I want to go, was it ever inside of you that you thought, okay, someday I'm going to be a CEO? Well, I certainly always aspired to do more and to have broader responsibilities. Uh, I, I hoped at one, at one point that I could get that opportunity. And uh, in many ways, that's why I went back to business school. Uh, right, when you were at Fox. When I was at Fox, I uh, really wanted to... Um, Learn. I wanted to develop more skills. I wanted to understand a broader, uh, a broader array of things around around business, and uh, I wanted to go back to school. So I went back part time. I was a fully employed uh, MBA student at, the, at the, the Anderson School. The three year, three year program. Right. Uh, you went, you know, a couple classes at uh, at a time, and. Yeah, it took three school years, and uh, for me it was great because I, I I just was able to broaden my knowledge of of, of business. The I met a lot of great people. The teachers were great. Um, projects that I worked on really allowed you to really learn and understand what 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 it was like to run a business and think about business in a different way. And for me, it, quite frankly, it gave me a lot more confidence. It, it was for me a confidence builder that I that I had that that MBA and 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 was able to then. Um, do a lot more at Fox, um, maybe not directly as a result of it, but as a result of having a little more confidence in what I was doing. Right. So for me, the business school Anderson's network allowed me to meet you and people like you. So has it done the same thing for you? Have you, you as, as, has the network helped you in your, in your career? You know, um, yeah, yeah, it has. I mean, I definitely, uh, know a lot of people through Anderson. Uh, I've, a couple of years ago, joined the board of visitors, which is now the board of um, advisors for the Anderson School, and and that's been great it's to get to know a lot of the uh, the alumni uh, at a, on a different level. Um, but yeah, I think I think for me, the the benefit of the school was much more about the confidence building and the learning, and a little bit less about the network, mainly because I stayed in the in the role that I was in I, when I when I graduated. I didn't leave my company and didn't didn't. Um, uh, get another job as a result of having my, my MBA. I stayed there from, I think I graduated in 2001 and I didn't leave, uh, Fox to come to Hulu until 2013. So, you know, 12 years later. Right. And you know, the, the entertainment industry, it's thought of as this creative industry, a lot of creative people, there are MBAs. I mean, you're an MBA, a lot of management has MBAs, but do you see the value of it in the entertainment space for younger people that want to work in entertainment? Oh, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, we're definitely, there are definitely two sides of the brain that you use in the entertainment business. And I think, I think people that can uh, work both, both sides are the ones that, that ultimately can rise to, 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 you know, big jobs in, in, in Hollywood. Um, clearly, there are a lot of creative executives that have risen all the way to be the CEO and the chairman of the, of the company. Um, and I think increasingly you're seeing people also with MBAs and that, that come up through the business side, whether it's through finance or, or marketing or, uh, in my case, distribution. And uh, I think you need both. You need to be able to, to, to navigate both sides of that. Right. And then when you combine that with like a passion for sales and not taking no for an answer... MBA with that becomes pretty unstoppable. <laughs> well, um, definitely, I think, I think that that's helped, for sure. Cool. So now let's talk about your business. A lot of changes here. Um, how do you see the business today, and you know, what excites you about it? Well, you know, this is an exciting year for us at Hulu. If you, if you take a step back and look at the company over, over a 10-year period, um, we've really transformed from what was a free website of, of last night's TV from Fox and NBC, you know, about 10 years ago. Uh, and by the way, it was only available really on desktops and laptops then because you weren't streaming content on an f- iPhone or on a connected device in your living room. 
Um, and to go from there all the way to, to today, where we're on the cusp of not only being a subscription on demand business, but we're going to be a pay TV operator in, 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 in just days. And, and I think that's a super exciting thing to be doing. Um, what I think's unique for us is that we're, we're not just going to be a pay TV distributor of other channels, but we also have this vibrant subscription on demand business that when you put those together, uh, with all of the licensed content that we've purchased and now these big originals that we're making, uh, I think we're in a pretty unique place to try to grab market share. Right. Yeah, I agree. And in business school, we talk a lot about job to be done. So what do you think people are hiring Hulu to do? Is it they want your original stuff? Do they want next day broadcast TV? Do they want this live package now? There's, is it all of that? There, there's, it's a really a broad offering. Well, and I think that's a, uh, one of the challenges we have is that we can be all of those or any of those to any individual. And so I think from a marketing and communication standpoint, we really have to be sure who we're talking to and what role can we play for them. Uh, in some cases, w- people may come in. In fact, we had a really big day yesterday when we launched our, our big original, The Handmaid's Tale, in terms of people subscribing to Hulu. Um, clearly, a lot of people were coming in to subscribe to watch that show. Um, other days, people are coming in because there was a, a big show on one of the broadcast networks that we have the next day rights for, and so they're clearly coming in to catch up on that show. Um, over time, you know, we think people will will make Hulu their primary, you know, subs- uh, primary video source, which is what you become when you're an MVPD or an over-the-top television provider, and so. I think really being specific and understanding the consumer uh, and, and what stage of their, of their uh, video life they're in and, and trying to match what we can deliver with what their needs are. And we have a lot of choices. We're going to have an $8 package and we're going to have a $40 package. And I think um, having, having that variety means you have to be very good at the marketing messaging and targeting your message and, and really not mixing up your messaging to the to the right consumer and it's a, it's a hard job and and it's something we're going to have to really focus on this right. year. Right. Absolutely because today consumers get their video content in a much different way and what you're talking about is definitely the future but how do you translate that into today? Yeah, well, I think um today which is not was not necessarily the case 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. Uh, performance marketing and digital marketing allows you, and which is one of the things we actually sell to advertisers as well, it allows you to really um, understand the, the consumer that you have an opportunity to put a message in front of online, whether it's a display ad, a search ad, a video, you know, programmatic video ad. Um, you, you really can uh, understand who you're talking to and it, for, through a variety of ways, try to, try to match the message to the consumer. And I think that that is a is something that certainly you can do today. I think it's going to get even better in the future, um, and that's that's the that's the goal is to say, all right, do we think this person is in the market now for an MVPD service, or do we think this person wants to add another subscription on demand offering to their to their life, and and trying to make sure that we we put the right thing in front of them because if if you if you're wrong there, if somebody is really looking to say, hey, I want to add an eight dollar I'm more likely to want to add an $8 subscription package to the things that I'm already buying, and we put a MVPD in front of them, that might not work. Right. Um, conversely, if somebody is really looking to cut the cord or get a pay TV service because they're moving or because they're, they're just in the market, and we're putting the wrong message of a subscription on demand offering in front of them, that too isn't going to work. So we have to be pretty good at that. Right. So <clears throat> you talked about this, these next day broadcast rights that you have, and that's a big differentiator uh, between you and the competition. But essentially, you're in the storytelling business trying to get great video to people in the way that they want to consume it. Same as Netflix, same as, as Amazon's um, you know, media practice. So how do you think about the competition and how do you think about differentiating? Well, you have to. Uh, you have to differentiate. You have to understand what, what's, um, what's the reason people are subscribing to the other services and, and what are the niches that you can try to go and fulfill. And so I think for us, um, clearly having the next day broadcast content as a differentiator in the subscription on demand space um, I think in, over time, original programming is, is the clearest way you can define yourself because that's, by definition, 
or the only you you're the only one that has it right so you know our our slate of originals will be different than somebody else's slate of originals and so figuring out what exactly a hulu original means to consumers is super important for us and we're we're going down that path now uh you know i think um having the the option for a all-encompassing tv service like our live service is also a differentiator for us and so um, we think there's a variety of ways to differentiate, but really understanding your competitors and then what are the op- opportunities for you to set yourself apart um, is is important. And for us, it's going to be various content f- types, right? So we're, we have a long list of exclusive shows that you can only get at Hulu, and so making sure that people understand that that we have we have you know we have these shows and they don't, you know, and and then they're going to do the same thing to us. And I think having that having that out in the in the market is is the is the interesting part. Right. So last question here on the business, your owners, they are, I, I mean, I think of Hulu as kind of a hedge for them. And if Hulu does great, it kind of disrupts their existing business. And I mean, it's great to think about disrupting yourself, but how do, you know, how, to, how does that get balanced? Well, I think that um, certainly there, there are disruptions happening in the marketplace, whether Hulu exists or not. Right. And I think we've ar- architected the business together in a way that while there may be some, some disruption, it's generally positive uh, when you think about it from the standpoint of we're going to have our own pay TV service. So if you're, uh, you're a consumer and you want to switch from one of the legacy providers to an over-the-top provider like us, they win. You know, the, 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 the owners and other content providers that are part of our service, they generally will be better off um, having Hulu be the provider of their channels. Um, we provide an array of benefits to them from targeted advertising to understanding the consumer better, et cetera. And I think that, that, that we tried to architect in a way that, that everybody wins if, if, we, if we grab that subscriber. On our subscription on demand side, you know, we're, we're a healthy buyer of content. I mean, we, we're spending a lot of money buying uh, shows that have been in this sort of new syndication world of subscription on demand and making shows from almost every studio out there. And so I think that we're, we're symbiotic with them in a lot of ways. And, and then on the advertising business, you know, we're sort of on the forefront of, or not sort of, we are on the forefront of targeted um, advertising, this one-to-one relationship that you can now have with consumers via digital and via IP. We're the ones that are really crafting that in premium video. Right. So. Uh, you know, if you're watching This Is Us from NBC on Hulu, um, I'm going to get a different ad in that than you will, right? And so we're able to, uh, through a variety of ways, um, provide our network partners with with targeting capabilities that allow them to really to give the customer a better experience and, and the advertiser a better experience by matching up uh, the right ad to the right person at the right place. And I think that that's something that we're we're developing and 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 our 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 network partners are utilizing, and I think so. So, for many ways, I think we're we, we net positive for them, uh, even if there is some disruption in the market. Right, and that advertising targeted—that's that's the piece of it that people point to that grows the entire pie. Yeah, and so you are their you know tech company that's out there pushing the limits on that. Yeah, when you think about it, if you um, you know uh, targeting advertising and and. And and making making co- uh, advertising relevant to customers is is a win win across the board, right? Because as a consumer, you really don't want to be shown advertising that doesn't make any sense for you to see. It, it, it's a, it, it's sort of wasting your time. Um, networks and 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 uh, the demographics of network viewership is essentially a proxy for targeting, right? So if somebody wants to reach uh, women eighteen to thirty four. For, 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 for a product that they're selling, they sort of proxy the networks based on their viewership, um, and they, target, they, they put advertising on those networks that have a higher percentage of women 18 to 34 watching it. Um, but by definition, that's not 100%, so you waste a fair bit of advertising that way. Well, with this digital marketing, you don't waste anything. You know, we, we can be, we're pretty good at understanding who's watching. We have profiles. We sort of have a, a pretty good idea who's watching, um, and therefore, we, if you want to reach a certain demographic or a certain psychographic or purchase intent, we can be really precise on, on making sure that we expose your advertising exactly to whom you want to. Um, and that's just better for everyone. Right. That makes total sense. Okay, so let's 
get some personal stuff now, Mike. Sure. Um, do you think that you have a worldview that's different from, from other people, different from everybody else, that makes you unique and makes you able to, to be the CEO of this company? Ooh, that's a heavy question. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think most people have different worldviews than, than everyone else. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we're, we're polarized as a society and um, why, there's, why it's great to know other people, right? Because if, if, if uh, I think different opinions and different views of things is what, what's healthy and what, 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 that's the spice of life almost in some right. ways. I mean, for me, I think, um, I, I think what I'm trying to do here at Hulu is bring a point of view and a direction to where we're heading. You know, I, I, I think having, you know, state, you know, stating a vision for the company is really important. We've got nearly 1,600 employees now. We'll probably have 2,000 by the end of the year. And so as a leader, I think you really have to have to articulate where you're going, why are you going there, and why do you think you're going to be successful if, ever, if we do the things that we say we're going to do. And I think it's important that everybody in the company understand that and, um, and quite frankly, help shape it because it's not me going up to the top of the hill and coming down with some tablets and saying, here we go, this is the plan. We do it in an iterative process. But my job is to really guide everybody towards the right direction and, and make clear about, well, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And so, so I guess in that way, I guess I do bring a, a different point of view, but I try to let um, the folks here help shape it because there are a lot of really smart people here, and I'd be foolish not to listen to them and, and take their point of view. Right. And how about a mentor or like a role model? Have you ever had anybody like that in your life? Oh, sure. You know, I've had, um, I've had, I've been fortunate to have a lot of mentors, um, both good ones and bad ones. You know, I think you you can learn as much from someone that that uh, that. Uh, uh, you can learn as much from people that you may not enjoy working for or watch how not to do something than you can from seeing how to do something. And I think, so on both sides of it, I think I've, I've been lucky to have, um, have, have, have them. And so I do have a few people that I rely on. And, um, you know, I think is, it, it's, it may be not apparent. Um, it certainly wasn't apparent to me until I got into this role, but it's, when you when you are the CEO of the company or you're the top, you know you're sort of in in this building, you know you really don't have a peer, right? You're 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 the there's there's no peer relationship. Um, it really means there aren't as many people you can go and sit down and say, hey, I've got a problem. Um, how can you help me personally, right? And so I think it's really important that you develop people, you know, mentorship opportunities outside of the outside of the workplace because um, you can be a little more open and share and get really good advice, um, which is sometimes hard to do when you're, when there's not, you're not sure exactly who you can, can go to internally. Right. I mean, everyone says it's, it's lonely at the top. Exactly. So you have others, you've had mentors throughout your career and now you have other people at your level, other CEOs that sure. you can go bounce ideas off of. Absolutely. I think it's really important. And I think if you, you know, you know, there, I'm sure there are some really, uh, there are some geniuses out there that don't need that. Uh, I'm certainly not one of them, and I think having having the ability to go and, and, and sort of bounce ideas off of people, share, uh, be open about, hey, I think I'm screwing this up. I really need some help on how am I lo- what am I doing wrong here? How do I get it turned around? I think having being able to do that is important. Okay. Well, last question. I'm bought in. You said you're hiring 400 people this year. I'm about to graduate. Can I have a job here? <laughs> sure, I can set I can set you up with the right recruiter. Um, okay. What's interesting about that question um, is uh, uh, seriously, we'll help, I'll get you the right person. But but that's about all I do uh, at Hulu. I, I I get a lot of folks looking you know to have um, their their friends get a job, you know, parents that have have older children that want internships and things and. One of the things that I decided early on is that um, it's not good for that person if I walk over to somebody else and say, I think you need to hire that person. It doesn't really set them up for success. And right. so what I tend to try to do is, you know, get get the candidate to the right place efficiently, maybe give them some encouragement and, and some thoughts on how best to approach it. But um, people get their own jobs here. And I think that really, really helps set them up for success. Because if you think about it, if somebody says, hey, well, they got that job because Mike said to hire him, that, that's not generally going to be a place for someone to succeed. And so um, 
that's not just a cop out to say, hey, I can't get you a job. But it, it really is, I think, important that when you're in organizations, when you look around and go, well, that person's only here because of X, Y, or Z, I think that's not a healthy culture. I agree. Okay, well, Mike, this you was bet. so much fun talking with you. Thank you You'd, very much. You too. Enjoy. Okay. Thanks for talking with us. And thank you for listening. If you liked listening, you should subscribe. And leave us some comments on iTunes. Let us know what you think. We'll be back soon with another great guest. See you then.